So, you know, um, maybe it becomes clearer uh, if I, if I uh, talk about what I call the advantages to intergenerational justice as uh, uh, taking turns. So thinking about it in terms of taking turns. First, I think one of the things that's good about it is, is that it's readily accessible um, to common intuitions. Uh, even though the way I, I, I parse it out and develop it, it gets a little bit richer and, and more um, involved, as it were, um, and you know, it may then uh, lose some of its uh, uh, appeal. Um, but we all know what it is to take turns, right? Because uh, that's what you learn as, uh, as children. There you have to take turns uh, with, uh, you know, going on the swing on the playground. It's something we learn very early on. And uh, what do we say um, to, uh, let's say, a rambunctious kid who uh, really uh, wants to go on the swing and go, uh, you know, uh, very heavily and jump on it and jump down on it? And, you know, what do you say? You say, well, you only own your turn. Yes, you have five minutes now, but you see the line over there? <laughs> and the, the, the swing has to remain in a workable condition for them. So you don't own the swing. That's the interesting thing. You only own your turn with a swing. So you have something unique here. You have some ownership. That's the uniqueness, the irreplaceability. It's just for you, the swing, just for you now but it's not your swing. It's never going to be your swing, right? Um, because others used it before you. You're just getting it from them. And there are others who want to use it after you. And so the others before you and the others after you, they're already there in some way. Even though it is yours, it's just yours right now. No one else can go on the swing with you right now, just you. But they are there. You can't forget them because you only own your turn, not the swing. You see? That's what I find is useful about the notion of taking turns. Um, and uh, as I said, it emerges out of, an, this is another example, uh, advantage, I think, it emerges out of an ontological condition, the non-coincidence of time, now is taking turns with each other. It emerges out of this natal mortal character of human agency. And if you apply it to, um, uh, democratic institutions, uh, which I do with the help of uh, Aristotle and, and Derrida, then it also uh, applies to uh, institutions, to um, uh, taking turns with institutions. Um, so there more could be said about that. Now, some of the advantages also lie in the fact that um, you avoid what's called meriological accounting, meras, again, um, um, also means part in ancient Greek, uh, by meriology is the study of parts. Um, and so uh, if there is a whole, I take certain parts from it, what other parts do I owe you? That's meriological accounting. Um, and uh, that's um, what we do when we think about um, cutting a cake, for example. Uh, there are five kids, they all want a slice of the, the cake. And uh, the first cutter you know, cuts a very big piece, let's say. Then the question is, well, how much does she have to leave for the other kids? Right? So that's meriological accounting, the study of parts in relation to the whole. Um, and that is the dominant model for thinking about how, what we owe with respect to nature to future people. That is the dominant model. But you can see that it gets into certain kinds of problems because the cake is the kind of thing that uh, you use up in sharing it. In sharing it, you use it up. Uh, but that's not what you want to do with something like nature, right? Um, because it is a holistic object with holistic rela uh, interrelations, you want to pass it on intact, as it were, right? As one thing. The thingness is problematic, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But, um, and yet, you want to be able to, to take from it. Right? So, um, and um, I think with respect to uh, an object of that kind, an object, again, in, in quotation marks, uh, taking turns recommends itself. 
uh, because what it says is, uh, it doesn't say that, oh, you can take a part and then you can calculate um, how much you have to leave for others. What it says is, no, the question of justice is now a different question. The question is not, um, how much must I substitute for what I take? But the question now is, um, what is it to take a fair turn with it? Just like with the swing example, the, qu the question of justice has now changed. So the question is no longer, um, so we want to share the swing, um, how much of the chain and how much of the seat do I get and how much do you get, right? That's no longer the question. The question is, um, what is it to take a fair turn? And um, I say uh, here that, well, there are certain kinds of, um, in, in the longer version of this, um, I, I talk about these three ways. But if you can think of others in which you fill this notion of what is it to take a fair turn with content, let me know. By equivalence with respect to reception, I mean, well, you can tell to the kid on the swing, you can say, you have to leave it in at least as good a state as you encountered it in when you got to the swing. At least as good a state. Right? This is what I mean by equivalence with respect to reception. When you got it, it was in a certain condition. You cannot leave it in a worse condition. That's, that's one. Uh, we find this, uh, for example, in uh, Italian trains. If you've ever taken a train in Italy, it'll say in the bathroom, please leave the bathroom in the condition in which you found it in. <laughs> right? Now, <laughs> you can see the problems with that too, right? Uh, it can't be all that you want to say um, for the obvious reasons that that example already indicates. It may be that you get it in a pretty bad state. Um, the other point is that you could say, and I, I do think that is the, the most promising one, you could say that um, it has to be functioning for the next turn taker. So you, what you would say to the kid is, um, well, one thing, you, 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 you cannot leave it in a worse state than in which you got it, but in addition to that, you have to make sure it's functioning for the next turn taker. So you have to take care of it. Now that's a little bit more. Like for a, ki a kid might then, a kid might, you might not want to say that to a kid because if it breaks and it's not really the kid's fault, you would call on a third party to fix it, right? But if there is no such third party, because we only have the generations and we don't have a non-historical generation that can come in and do all the fixing for us, then that's not available to you. So then you have to say, well, it's only me who can fix it for the next generation if it breaks, right? So you have to leave it in a functioning condition. And because, I'm going very quickly here, but because I argue that uh, past and future generations are already in some sense implicated in the present generation, uh, you can't play off one generation against another. So it is not permissible to say, I got it from the past in this state, so that's all I have to care about. I only have to look to the past. This is how I got the swing. This is how I'm going to leave it. My argument is that because both past and future are co-implicated in the, in the present, that's not available to you. You can't just look at one generation. You must also look at the future generation. And then you get an interplay of these two. Um, okay, but um, that's perhaps a bit more, uh, involves a bit more argument that I'm, I'm willing to flesh out if, if we get to it. Um, the flourishing part, that's what Alan Habib favors. So, so he, he's, is, is, he has written, there's one paper on taking turns um, that's very good actually, but has, differs from, from my conception. Um, he argues that the conception ought to be, um, it has to be a flourishing thing. So what you pass on has to be in a flourishing state. With respect to the Earth, you might want to say, well, what is it for Earth to flourish? Um, and he would say, well, I don't know. I'm a philosopher. You have to ask ecologists and botanists and, uh, and um, zoologists. And so how much biodiversity can we lose? And you know, we are engaging in these kinds of calculations. Um, and, so, and, that, and, and they have to come up with flourishing nature. And that's what you owe, he, he argues. Um, OK. Um, but maybe you have other ideas. Uh, what, what is it uh, to take a fair turn is the question, right? Um, another advantage, I think, is that it helps us to come back to the Obama quote at the beginning. 
Um, the, there I said the, the issue is um, politically we have to think of ourselves as unique with a unique responsibility but at the same time understanding ourselves as only one generation in a long chain of generations stretching to the past and the future. And I, I think taking turns helps us to do that. Um, and uh, now you may say, well, how is a generation unified? You have emphasized overlap among generations, and overlap means a gener there's constantly a, a new member and an old one dying off, right? Maybe not, not even an old one, but you see what I mean. So there's constantly this changeover within a generation, um, and so how is it unified? Well, it's a very good question. Um, and uh, uh, the best answer I've come up with is, uh, is I think, <laughs> implicit in the Obama quote, uh, and that is the answer. Um, and it's also worked out by, um, by Diltai, by the way, who who's, says only the, the word generation only appears once in, uh, in, in being in time, um, and then it's with reference to Diltai. And, and Diltai's uh, conception is in fact that the unification uh, takes place in view of some kind of a crisis. Um, and that is I think what Obama says too. We are the first and the last generation with respect to climate change. Well, because climate change is a big crisis and that's what ought to unify us as a turn taker. Right?